All right. Well, if I would have asked you four months ago, what is the most boring book of the Bible? My guess is that a heavy number of people would have said Leviticus, right? Leviticus, boring book in the Bible. But my hope is after 12 weeks of adventuring through the book of Leviticus, at this point you would say, you know, actually Leviticus is one of the most fascinating books of the Bible. It's filled with these little nuggets that foretell and foreshadow that Jesus is coming. It teaches us key lessons about God, like God wants you to be clean so that you can be close. That all those laws that we see in the book of Leviticus are not just because God likes rules and he wants to wreck your life, but instead a holy God has camped in the middle of an unholy people and that holy God says, I want to be in relationship with you. Because I love you so much, let me tell you about my grace so that you can be clean in order to be close to me. Leviticus is actually a glimpse at the heart of God who wants his people to be deeply in touch with who he is. And at the same time, God is making a unique community. A community of people that live by different standards, that eat different foods, that have different childbirth laws, that take skin diseases seriously, that talk about sexual morality in different ways and use their finances in ways that would honor God. All of these things are in Leviticus because God is creating a people that's different from the Egyptians and different from the Canaanites and different from any culture surrounding them. They are God's people. So he gives us this book to give us a glimpse at what it means to be God's people, what it means to be close to God, and how to live life according to his purposes. And I hope you would look at the book of Leviticus and say, it's been really, really a good adventure. But we've got one more chapter in the book of Leviticus to cover before we're done. It's chapter 27. You can turn your Bibles to Leviticus 27 and uh, your clean guides to page 75 if you want to. And it's a chapter that's got things about redeeming that honestly mostly only makes sense in the culture. Except there's one section that makes sense for us in our culture, and it's the section about finances. It's a section about giving, and so we're gonna go ahead and tackle that, because that's what we do, right? When you preach through a Bible, you preach the first, or a book of the Bible, you preach the first chapter and the last chapter, and some people don't like when the pastor gives sermons on giving, but I don't care. Because it's next, and that's what we do, right? We preach what's next, and that's the next thing in the scriptures. So chapter 27, (coughs) maybe I won't be preaching. Hmm. All right, the Lord wants me to preach. (laughs) Here we go, chapter 27, beginning at verse 30, says this. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Whoever would redeem any of their tithe must add a fifth of the value to it. Every tithe of the herd and flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod will be holy to the Lord. No one may pick out the good from the bad or make any substitution. If anyone does make a substitution, both the animal and its substitute become holy and cannot be redeemed. All right, so it begins by talking about this concept of a tithe, concept of a tithe. Essentially, that means 10% of everything belongs to the Lord. That word tithing, if you're new to biblical language, that word tithing literally just means tenthing. It means tenthing. It's giving 10% to God. So one out of every 10 apples you pick belongs to God. One out of every 12 baskets of barley belongs to God. One out of every 10 uh, animals belongs to God. And he says you can't just pick out the bad ones and give those to the Lord. No, no, no. You just hold your rod out, make the flock go underneath it, and you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, the Lord's. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, the Lord's. Every 10th one that passes under the shepherd's rod, good or the bad, they go to the Lord. They are dedicated to him. And so the parallel for us today is that a tenth of everything would belong to the Lord. A tenth of our paychecks, a tenth of our gifts, a tenth of our stimulus checks. Whatever it is that comes in, it belongs to the Lord. And it goes to the Levites. 
So the Levites were the priests of the day. They were set up for all the holy functions of the people. And so a tenth of all of the income, because the Levites didn't have their land, they didn't have productive enterprises to make money, a tenth of it would all go to the Levites to pay for the expenses of what uh, the Levites did for the group. Now, a question would have been asked in this chapter and of the Levites, that, that odd thing about can you redeem these and then use cash instead? And the question was asked because oftentimes when they were taking their tithe to the place of worship or to the Levites, it was a long journey. And sometimes it's hard to take a bunch of your flock or a bunch of barrels of barley or apples or whatever to go to the place of worship. And they're asking the question, can we just cash it in and bring the cash and give the cash at the place of worship? The answer in Leviticus is yes, add 20% to it, and it's just fine. You can be able to go and uh, redeem that amount. But that's not the question that most Christians are asking because we, we have production in different ways. Ours are usually related to cash and not to cashing in uh, specific pieces. What Christians ask when they come across tithing passages in Leviticus and other Old Testament places is, should Christians tithe the same way as they did in the Old Testament? And the answer to that question is, it's complicated. <laughs> It's complicated. And there's a lot of reasons why it is complicated. You may have heard me in the past as I've been teaching about giving towards the church that I would say something like, tithing is a helpful benchmark for Christian giving. But it's not the starting place and it's not the ending place. It's not the be all and end all. In fact, it can create some pretty ugly attitudes inside of you. But with that being said, it's a helpful benchmark for Christian giving. Now, I also told you, usually when I teach those, that this is a complicated subject. And someday when I'm teaching through Leviticus or Deuteronomy, I'll tell you why it's complicated. So friends, that day has come. You guys ready for this? This is why it's a complicated question. Tithing begins in the Old Testament. And it's pervasive throughout the Old Testament. In fact, it goes, giving goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, when Cain and Abel had their skirmish over giving to the Lord. The first time you see a tenth talked about is in Genesis chapter 14, when Abraham, the father of Israel, runs into this guy named Melchizedek, a priest king of the city of Salem, who represents Jesus. And you find Abraham giving Melchizedek a tenth of everything that he had. That's the place where the idea of a tithe gets established. Then throughout the law, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, it talks about tenthing, giving tenths to the Lord. But probably the most famous verse in the Old Testament related to tithing comes from the book of Malachi, chapter 3. Some people call him the Italian prophet, Malachi. This is what Malachi says in chapter 3. Bring the whole tithe, the whole tenth, into the storehouse. That's where the Levites are. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. Now pause right there. This is a famous verse because it's the only place in the Bible that the Lord says, test me in this. Usually the common knowledge is you don't test the Lord. You don't test the Lord your God. But in this case, God himself says, test me in this. Bring in the tenth and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So preachers love to preach this and people love to hear this because there is a connection of blessing that comes along with the idea of tithing. But what's pervasive throughout the Old Testament is that there is this 10% number that's to be given to the Levites and the priests, and that's their starting place, 10% to the Levites. But wait, there's more. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 17 and 18, it says this. You must not eat in your own towns the tithe of your grain and new wine and olive oil or the firstborn of your herds and flocks or whatever you vowed to give or your free will offerings or special gifts. Instead, you are to eat them in the presence of the Lord your God at the place the Lord your God will choose. You, your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants and the Levites from among your towns. And... You are to rejoice before the Lord your God in everything that you put your hand to. Now, this passage in Deuteronomy tends to point towards a different kind of a tithe. 
Not one that's given to the Levites, but one that's set aside for a party. And there's another parallel passage in Deuteronomy that matches that giving with a 10% number. And so you have this idea that the Israelites are supposed to not just give 10% to the Levites, but they're also supposed to set aside 10% for a big party. That sounds like fun, doesn't it? I mean, could you imagine all of Israel getting together? It would have been brought together in the place God would have his name dwell. We now know that that's Jerusalem. At the time, they didn't know that, but it would be Jerusalem. They would all get together. The entire nation would come together for Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of the First Fruits. And in that one week period of time, one huge party with 10% of their income given towards that party. Now, can you imagine if we did something like that at Christ Community? And we said, hey, everybody, save 10% of your money for a year, and we're all going to set up in the parking lot and have a $20 million party for seven days. That would be a ball, wouldn't it? Spare no expense, kids. We're going to be biblical here. So you imagine that this would also be culture-forming for them. Because the time when mom and dad are most likely to spend the most money is the time that they come before the Lord to remember their freedom and to remember their uh, exodus from Egypt and to remember that God's the one who provides all things. And so they remember these things in the context of a worship experience. So that's 10% to the Levites, 10% to the festivals, but wait, there's more. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 14, it says this, at the end of every three years... Bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store it in your towns so that the Levites, who have no allotment or inheritance of their own, and the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied, and so that the Lord your God may bless you in the work of your hands. So now every three years, there's another tithe that's not to be set aside for the party or for the Levites. It's to be set aside for the poor that's in their midst. So if you equal that out, you've now got 10% to the Levites, 10% for the party, 3.3% that goes towards the poor. But wait, there's more. Because you remember back at the beginning of Leviticus, there were seven different kinds of sacrifices that took place. You remember that? And each of those sacrifices had animals that would come from your herd or animals that you needed to buy. That was all in addition to this money that was given. Plus, people who owned fields were told that your fields are only to be harvested in the middle, but leave the edges around the sides near where the roads are. Leave those for the poor so that they can glean from the sides of the field and eat as they walk along the road. Well, that's not enough because there were also times where there were special offerings like, hey, we're building a tabernacle. Hey, we're building a temple. Can you bring in special offerings? And I know what's happening right now is some of you are doing head math. And you're saying 10%, 10%, 3.3% plus sacrifices, gleaning, special moments, and hospitality. You're up somewhere around 30% of income by this point. Now, can you see why I said it's complicated? It's complicated because Old Testament giving was complicated. So let's just ask this question. If we followed the law exactly as Christians, and I'm not espousing that we do, but let's just theoretically look at this. If we were supposed to follow the law as Christians, what would that look like? Well, with our income, a tenth of it would go to the local church. That's the equivalent of what the Levites uh, and priests are like. Tenth would go to the local church. Then a tenth would go to some party that we do during the year. Probably the closest parallel for us is Christmas. It's celebrating Jesus. We spend a lot of money. Some people spend 10% that week anyway, so we'll just call it that. Then 3% that goes to the poor. Benevolence, personal giving to the poor, open door mission, world vision, those kinds of giving. And then on top of that, there would be Capital campaigns, Christian radio, parachurch giving, camping giving, hospitality, when people come over to your house, being generous with your food. And if you did this, you would be at up around 30% per year. If people actually did this, churches would thrive, ministries would never lack money, the poor would be cared for, the world, of, the world mission of Jesus would never be underfunded. So the result would be great, but this is not the most important question. The most important question is, what does the Bible teach? 
And what does the New Testament say about the tithing that's there in the Old Testament? And what I'd like to go do is I'd like to go back to our old friend, the paradigm that helps to teach us, hey, if we see something in the Old Testament, we want to know if it applies in the New Testament for Christians today, what is the paradigm we should look through? And in this case, it's the three R words, repeated, repealed, and realized. Is it repeated in the New Testament? Is it repealed in the New Testament? Is it realized in the New Testament? And the answer to that question is, it's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated because it's not super clear. In fact, there's only one time in the New Testament that a percentage related to money is brought up. It's in Matthew chapter 23, and Jesus has given it to the Pharisees at that point in Matthew chapter 23, calling them a brood of vipers and a bunch of hypocrites. And one of the things he says is, oh, you tithe your dill and your mint and your cumin, every little bit. He probably had that voice with it as well. He says, but you've forgotten the most important things of God, justice and righteousness and mercy I wish you hadn't forgotten the former, but that you had remembered the latter. What Jesus is essentially saying is that tithing is important, but you shouldn't be concerned about the nitpicky legalisms of the Old Testament if you're forgetting what the big deal is. Righteousness, justice, and mercy. That's the main thing. The tithe is a secondary thing. Jesus continues to teach in the New Testament about, uh, about giving and about who he is and about what he expects of his disciples. But one of the things you never find Jesus saying is that I expect, guys, 10% from you. He doesn't say what's owned by God from you is 10% of everything you have and everything you are. He doesn't say, guys, what God wants from you is your 30%. He wants your very best 30%. No, no, no. When Jesus calls people to follow him, he doesn't call them to follow at 10% or 30%. He calls them to follow him at 100%. 100%. It's a paradigm shift. It's an all-in moment. It's where Jesus says, all you have Every dollar in the bank, every moment on the clock, every gift that you have inside of you, it all belongs to God because it all came from God. That's why we love this saying around Christ community, it's all God's anyway. Somebody say that with me. Ready? It's all God's anyway. Everything we have belongs to God. Jesus pointed this out one time when there was a woman who came to the temple Actually, a dude came in first, and he was a rich dude. He had a lot of stuff to be able to give at the temple. He shows up with his impressive gift, drops it on the altar. Everybody claps. Yay, nice gift. And then a woman slips in the side door and just kind of quietly drops her two copper coins into the basket. She was a widow. And Jesus nudges his disciples. He says, hey, guys, did you notice that? She gave more than the rich guy gave. Why is that? Because she gave 100%. It was everything that she had, and she gave everything that she had. See, Jesus' invitation to all of us is to say, everything I have belongs to you, 100%. So we don't ask the question, what percentage of my money should I give to God? We ask the question, what percentage of God's money should I keep? Now, there's some helpful verses in the New Testament that talk about this. One of them is the verse that Carrie brought up in the video. And uh, I think it's a brilliant verse. Check this out. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says this. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Sow sparingly, reap generously. Sow, uh, 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 sow sparingly, reap sparingly as well. The key principle there is generosity. It's not a dollar figure, it's not a percentage, it's an attitude of the heart, generosity. Then next verse, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Or as Carrie taught us, that word cheerful could also mean hilarious. God loves a hilarious giver because when you're giving with your heart in the right place, what erupts out of you is not obligation or guilt. It's just sheer joy. I get to be a part of what God is doing in this world and I can't wait to be able to bring to contribute to those things. 
I love that God gives us these two attitudes, generous and cheerful or joyful or hilarious. But then there's a third one that's exemplified in 2 Corinthians as well. He's testifying about the Macedonian church who gave a special offering for the Jerusalem church that was going through a famine. Paul says this, For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. They gave beyond their ability, demonstrating that giving is not just out of the excess that you have that you don't really need, but sometimes giving is in a sacrificial position. So the New Testament giver is not asking external questions about percentages and dollars. They're asking internal questions. Am I generous? Am I joyful? Am I sacrificial? Those are the big three questions you've got to ask yourself. And can I be honest? It's harder to ask those questions than it is just to send a percentage and say, I'm good, I'm good. But God invites us on a spiritual journey where we're constantly re-asking the deeper questions of the soul. Am I generous? Am I joyful? Am I sacrificial? Now some of you are saying, oh, Mark, I'm new to this stuff. This is a new concept. Throw me a bone. Let's get practical. What's going on at the church? What's happening in my situation? What are some helpful parameters for giving for different situations? Now, if you're new to the church, you may not know that it's our practice at the church to be transparent about how finances are happening in good times and in bad times, and it's our practice to not be manipulative about finances. We just get clear about them and allow the Holy Spirit to work in people's lives for them to be compelled to give in the way that God leads them uh, to be giving at the time. So here's some facts about what's happening at Christ Community Church these days. The last time I told you what our situation was, it was New Year's, it was right in the New Year's, and I told you that we finished 2021 in the black due to some generous giving, and we all celebrated, yay, we're so glad we finished in the black. Since then, the first four months of the year, our budget has been rolling at about 88%, 88%, 88% of our budget. So I want to say a huge thank you to the faithful people who have given generously over this time. Even through difficult times, you've been giving. I love you. I'm grateful for the way that you're doing. But 88% is not 100%. And while we're not in trouble as a church, there's been some good stewardship and some extra giving in December that leaves us in a stable position. If we continue at 88% all the way through the end of the year, we're going to have to start making some really hard decisions related to ministry. So the people on our finance team said, well, we're going to do a little bit of homework and find out just what percentage of Christ community people are giving, giving anything at all. And they found that 58% of Christ community church regular attenders are giving at least $1. 58% are giving at least $1, which means 42% are giving nothing at all. And I know there's different situations for different groups of people. Some may be saving their giving and they give in one big chunk during the year. And some may be in very difficult financial straits and it's just impossible. They're unemployed, there's no income and uh, those kinds of things happen and that's okay too. In fact, the church exists for those kind of people who are going through rough times to give them money through our benevolence ministry, not to expect them to be giving money to the church. But my guess is that in that 42%, there are a lot of people who are there who just say, you know what, I've never been challenged with the concept that God owns everything. I've never been challenged with the fact that it's 100% for God. I've never been challenged to ask the question, what percentage should I keep for myself and what percentage should I give to God? And for many of you, there may be a step of obedience that you need to take. Let me knock that out in three categories that I oftentimes get asked about. Category number one is for the person who uh, is in a situation where they're saying, you know what, I'm deep in debt. I'm in a very difficult financial circumstance. Maybe it's because of situations out of your control, like medical debt. Maybe it's because you just overspent and were irresponsible at some point in your life. The question is, what now? Should I tithe even though I have a load of debt to dig out of? And I think that this is a matter of conviction. There is not a clear Bible passage that you can point to related to this. I'll confess that there was a time in our lives with Kelly and I 
when we had four young kids surviving on a pastor's salary, we had some unexpected expenses, and our consumer debt grew to embarrassing levels, I'll say. And we had to ask ourselves the question, are we going to continue to tithe or are going to use that money to pay off our debt faster? And we just decided that in our lives, we always only want to put God first. And we'd continue to give that tenth. I mean, we would do simpler vacations. We would buy no electronic devices. We would make a life of living on macaroni and cheese if we had to. But we didn't want to shortchange God from what we had pledged to give him. So we continued to give a tenth even during that time. But there may be some other people who have fallen on such difficult times where you go, I'm already doing all that stuff and there is just nothing to spare. There's no way that I could give a tenth. For me, I would encourage you to give something. A dollar, five dollars, fifty dollars, whatever it is that God puts on your heart and convicts you to be able to give. And the reason is not because the church needs your money, it's because your heart needs to give. It's because you need to establish in your heart, God, I am going to trust you. And when it's the most difficult time to be hanging on to your money, you'll say, okay, God, I will let go of the grip that I have on this to give some away and show some semblance of trust in you. Kelly and I have found that we would always rather try and survive on 90% with God than 100% without God involved in our finances. And so we've made a decision to go that way. Everybody, I think, should be able to say, I can give something. I can sacrifice somewhere to be able to make this happen. And then do your best to dig out of debt. Do everything you can. I want you to know as a church, we're here to help you with that. And we've got a class that we run from time to time called Financial Peace University. We just did one in the spring. We're going to do another one in the fall where there are financial experts who will help walk you through how to get out of debt. I just got a note from our Financial Peace class uh, representative. The teachers, they said, we had 13 attenders live even during COVID. And over the course of nine weeks, get this, nine weeks, they paid off over 20 thousand dollars in debt and they saved sixteen thousand five hundred and sixty nine dollars on top of that for a total swing of thirty six thousand dollars that they moved out of debt yeah let's congratulate these people they did a great job with that they're cutting up credit cards they're starting to give now it just feels good when you do that so let me encourage you if that's your position do your best get the help you need dig out of debt you'll be happy you did it for the rest of your life and as a church we would love to help you with that second category is someone who says i'm not deep in debt i'm just stable I'm a regular guy, I got an income, I got bills to pay, uh, stuff comes in every month or on an irregular basis. You know, what's, what should I do? I would say if you're in that stable position, it's a great idea to move towards a tithe, move towards that tenth. Not as a rule, but just as a benchmark of faithfulness. I think this is where that Malachi verse comes into play, where it says, test me in this and just see if I don't open up blessings all over you. I was at a men of God table having a discussion 6 a.m. on Friday mornings with a group of guys who were trying to hold each other to live in like men of God. And one of them, one of the senior guys in the group said, hey, I, the topic of tithing came up. He said, hey, back in the 90s, we struggled financially. We had little kids that were growing up and the finances were very real. It was a very difficult struggle. And then my wife and I decided that we're just gonna tithe. We're gonna put the Lord first. And he said, no kidding, since that day, we have always been financially stable. We haven't been rich, but we've always had enough to be able to get by. The Lord has always blessed us. And then the next guy at the table said, we did that too, same experience. And another guy said, we did that too, same experience. What they found is that when you're faithful to put God first, God's blessings come on your life. Maybe for you it's a matter of financial stewardship. Or maybe you're somebody who's saying, you know what, I'm hitting that empty nester phase of my life, and I've got a big house that was built for a bunch of kids, but the house is kind of empty these days. Maybe it's time for you to invite a Bible study over like the Friesens did, or maybe there's a resident that you say, you know what, for this fall, I would love to sponsor having a resident live with me in some of my empty space because this house belongs to God. All kinds of things that you can do to steward your life and your resources for the sake of the kingdom. But don't just stop at attempt. 
Tenth isn't a minimum, it's not a maximum. You want to get to the place where you're strategically asking, how can I generously move from where I am to crazy levels of generous? Now, crazy levels of generous sometimes come with wealth building. And people say, I've just, I've earned enough and I, I'm ready to give more away. Sometimes it comes with people who are just disciplined. I know some couples in this congregation who have just said, we've just made it a life goal to live simply and to not be selfish so that we can give more away. Because we love doing this, we're hilarious givers, and it gives us a chance to be a part of God's kingdom in ways that we never would have been before. I was visiting with a member of our congregation recently about his successful business career. He's in the final third of his life, but he's still working 40 hours a week. But he doesn't really have to work because he's already comfortably positioned for retirement. Even so, he's chosen to keep on working. When I asked him why, he said, I realize that I'm not working for myself and my family anymore. I'm now working for the Lord and other people who have struggles and don't have the opportunities that I had. Most of my future savings will go to faith-based organizations and other deserving charities. It is a good feeling. I have good health. I have good skills, a good business. So why not be the most generous I can be in my most productive years? I love that attitude. He's giving way beyond the tithe, even up to 100% of what he earns these days. That's just a regular guy right here at CCC. But around the country, through the years, massive amounts of kingdom potential have been released through people who say, God has blessed me financially and I'm going to be a generous, joyful, sacrificial giver, giving hilariously, prioritizing God first in my life. God's given me everything. How could I not give him everything back? That's the attitude that we need to have. And so I'm gonna challenge you to go home and just ask yourself the big three questions. Am I being generous? Am I joyful in my giving? Am I sacrificial in my giving? And allow the Holy Spirit to move in you and to help you to be able to answer those questions. The bottom line is that you need to listen to God to be generous, joyful, and sacrificial because in the end, it's all God's anyway. It's all God's anyway. All right. So that's the end of my little discussion on money. But I'll be honest, I did not want to end our Leviticus series talking about money, money, money. Because that's a part of Leviticus 27, but it's not the main idea of all of Leviticus. The big idea of all of Leviticus is this. Everything points to one person, one life, and that person is? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. Did you guys learn this in Leviticus? I'm going to give you another chance because I think you learned it better. It all points to one thing, one person, that person is? And I thought it'd be fun to end with a little bit of a call and response that gives us a review on the book of Leviticus. So if you guys would be willing to participate be, with me, I'd like to invite you to stand up. In the balcony, stand. Here on the main floor, stand. If you are at home, I want you to stand up and participate as we do this finishing effort. Here's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing a little bit of a call and response. And so I'm going to ask for everybody to participate in remembering the ways that we have seen Jesus throughout the book of Leviticus. So those of you who are in the balcony and those of you who are at home, you get to ask the big question, and that is, where is Jesus in Leviticus? Okay, so let's practice that in full voice. Where is Jesus in Leviticus? Ready? Where is Jesus in Leviticus? Good. Those of you who are on the bottom floor get to end each section. We'll have four sections. You'll get to end each section with everything points to Jesus. Okay, you ready? Let's bottom floor. And you got to beat the upper floor when you say this. You got to do it better than the upper floor. So main floor, everything points to Jesus. Ready? One, two, three. Everything points to Jesus. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. Then in between, when you ask the question and they give the answer, I've got three friends up here that are going to give little sub-points that come out of the book of Leviticus, particular passages. This is Joshua Lilly. He's my executive assistant. Yeah, we love Joshua. <laughs> this is Caitlin Fettig. She's a worship resident. Better clap for her, too. Yeah. And then we have Steve, 31-year veteran, the Yoast with the most right here. 
And these guys uh, are going to fill in the gaps in between the question and the answer. We're going to participate and do this all together. I'm just going to kind of be the choir master and point to different people, and you guys will say the words you're supposed to say. You guys ready for that? Come on. You guys ready for that? Come on. All right. So up in the balcony, let's ask the question. Ready? Where do we see Jesus in Leviticus? Well, Jesus is in the blood offerings, who himself is our perfect and final sacrifice. Jesus is in the grain offering. Jesus was the fine bread of life remembered in communion. And Jesus is in the peace offering, who allows us to be reconciled with God, with our neighbors, and anticipate the eternal peace of God. All right, main floor, now we answer the question, ready? Everything points to Jesus, really good. All right, so now we're gonna ask the question from chapters eight through 14, same question in the balcony, ready? Where do we see Jesus in Leviticus? Well, Jesus is in the food laws that were established to make the Israelites notably different. When Jesus came, he abolished the food laws, declaring that all people can be God's people. Mm. And Jesus is in the childbirth laws. Just as these laws protected women, Jesus too elevated women throughout his ministry in something that was distinctly different to the culture of his day. Jesus is in the skin disease laws, but when disease approached him, people were healed. And this freedom from sin, disease, and death extends to all of us today. Amen. All right, main floor, everything leads to Jesus. Ready? Everything leads to Jesus. All right, so chapters 15 and 16, the pinnacle of Leviticus. Balcony asked the question, where is Jesus in Leviticus? Ready? Where is Jesus in Leviticus? Okay. Jesus is our high priest who made one sacrifice and sat down saying, it, it is, is finished. finished. Yeah. And Jesus is also in the Day of Atonement. He came to tear the curtain in two so that you can access God every single day. Amen. Jesus is Amen. our scapegoat. Yeah. He removed our sins as far as the east is from the west, and God remembers them no more. In other words, the, the goat, goat has, has left, left the, the building. building. Yeah, all right. Main floor, here we go. Everything leads to Jesus. Now, chapter 17 all the way through 27. Top floor, ask yourself the question, where is Jesus in Leviticus? Well, Jesus is in the tabernacle. In it, we see things that represent friendship with God, the light of the world. And just as the tabernacle sat among the Israelites, God's presence dwells or tabernacles within us. Oh, yeah. Jesus is in the festivals, the Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits festivals point to Jesus' death and his burial and his resurrection. Amen, amen. And finally, Jesus is in our jubilee. Debts forgiven, slave set free, and personal restoration, Jesus did it all. All right, ready, here we go. Main floor, one last time. Everything leads to Jesus. And this is what we remember. It's not just the book of Leviticus. It's everything in the Bible, cover to cover. Everything points to the climax of the story, the person who did it all. Let's give it up for the one, the only, Jesus of Nazareth, who paid for our sins, died on the cross, rose from the dead, so that all of us could have new life. He is our life. He is our hope. He is Jesus, and this is why around Christ Community Church we say we are all for Jesus. Let's say it one more time. We are all for Jesus. Once again, we are all for Jesus.